Um, and sometimes the police reports from the czarist period were unusually frank. Um, like I, there's a part in the first chapter about World War One, all about the soldatki. The soldatki, what they were is they were the wives of soldiers who'd been, you know, mobilized into the army and were fighting at the front. Um, and they became a really strong social group, sort of. A, they seemed to have a kind of a collective identity during the First World War. Um, and they got involved in two main things. They they were mobilized. They mobilized themselves to stop the Stalipin land reform. You know, I mean, I don't know how many how much your readers know about Russian Ukrainian history, but they were in, from about 1906 to 19 uh, to, to the war. There was this thing called the Stalipin land reform, which was an attempt to kind of consolidate and privatize land holdings of peasants and break up the commune. The Tsarist government tried to continue that during the war, and the Soldatki hated it because they're Husbands were away, and they figured they wouldn't get a good deal, and so they were really they were so resistant that it led to these large scale riots. There was one particular one in what was it um, Nizhna Sirovatka um, that was so big that it they required the the not the governor but the governor's uh, the vice governor actually had to take a, take a train and go out there and be brought a, brought a small contingent of police with him to to put down the uprising. It was quite quite a fascinating. Thing. But it was, it was led by the Soldatki. Um, and so that was, I was very lucky there because the police had, had written a lot of very detailed um, reports on those um, uprisings and riots. And so I was able to use those. And sometimes they actually quoted them in those. They, they would quote the peasants. And so that was really surprising to get that kind of thing. But it was, it was hard, let me tell you. Most of that stuff from the Tsarist period, I had to read on microfilm. And... <laughs> Let me tell you, that was not fun. <laughs> Reading the microfilm was, they had these very old uh, uh, machines to try to read it, and it was, uh, it projects onto the screen, and it was, oh my God, it was, that was a nightmare. But anyway, so there's lots of challenges like that. I also, uh, since then, I've done a lot of research in uh, Kazan. Uh, it's the capital of, the, of, of Tatarstan. And in Kazan, I found all sorts of uh, crazy stuff going on in that archive. The, the woman... <laughs> I got to know the, the woman who ran the reading room really well, and she told me that she thought sometimes the people who were doing the collating or putting them together were actually maybe kind of drunk and were just sort of playing jokes by putting certain documents in there that were not relevant at all. I don't know if that's true, but she did tell me that there's a whole bunch of material in that archive um, upstairs somewhere that's just never even been filed. Like, nobody even knows whether it's in it. So, so you know, the challenges are tremendous. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I hope maybe there's, um, you know, a lot of Ukrainian historians are working in Ukrainian archives, and they're probably helping to organize the archives better than they used to be, because uh, that was a real challenge for me. But then, you know, so like I said, most of the material is based on what others wrote about what peasants said or did, um, and so you had to be pr very practiced at reading them. Um, this doing this thing historians do a lot, which is they look at look for unwitting testimony, you know, where basically the author of the document might be trying to tell me something, but I'm looking to see what maybe they're not telling me, you see. So it's, uh, that's one of the most fascinating things about being a historian, actually.